Hi, I'm Staff Sergeant Jimmy Williams. Join Petty Officer Christina Brockman and me on Navy Marine Corps News. This week, the groundbreaking for the first national monument honoring military and civilian veterans of World War II takes place in Washington, D.C. Marines in Hawaii prepare for deployment with a combined training exercise to test their combat readiness. And senior enlisted sailors and Marines use their experiences to prepare officer candidates for leadership in the fleet. These stories and more on Navy Marine Corps News. This week on Navy Marine Corps News, the groundbreaking of the first national monument honoring World War II veterans takes place in Washington, D.C. Marines in Hawaii prove their combat readiness as they get set to go on deployment. And enlisted sailors and Marines teach officer candidates how to be leaders in the fleet. These stories and more are next on Navy Marine Corps News. Welcome to Navy Marine Corps News. I'm Staff Sergeant Jimmy Williams. And I'm Petty Officer Christina Brockman. 55 years ago, our nation emerged victorious at the close of World War II. And while many generations of Americans have expressed gratitude for those who served, only recently have steps been taken for a more permanent tribute. Corporal Jimmy Perkins has the story. They have been called the greatest generation. The millions of Americans who served in the military and the civilians on the home front during World War II. This Veterans Day, 10,000 veterans, their families, and many dignitaries gathered on the National Mall for a long-awaited ceremony to break ground on the National World War II Memorial. Among the dignitaries was President Bill Clinton. With this memorial, we secure the memory of 16 million Americans, men and women who took up arms in the greatest struggle humanity has ever known. We hallow the ground for more than 400,000 who never came home. We acknowledge a debt that can never be repaid. The site is located on the National Mall between the Lincoln Memorial and Washington Monument. It will stand both as a remembrance of family and friends who served, but also as a lesson for future generations. From Guadalcanal to Omaha Beach, the millions of Americans who changed the course of civilization itself will have their names etched in the book of history in a far more profound and permanent way. This memorial is built not only for the children whose grandparents served in the war, but for the children who will visit this place a century from now, asking questions about America's great victory for freedom. The memorial is expected to be dedicated on Memorial Day 2003. Corporal Jimmy Perkins, Navy Marine Corps News. Our thanks to the American Battle Monuments Commission and the History Channel for providing video for that story. If you've ever been a recruiter, you probably know what a challenging job it can be. That's the reason the Chief of Naval Personnel and Commander of Navy Recruiting Command recognized the top recruiters with the Recruiter of the Year Awards. Seaman Jennifer Smith attended this year's ceremony and has the story. Uh, thank you for the inspirational example that you set every day, and thank you for sending us such wonderful young men and women uh, to start out their future and help keep our Navy number one. The Chief of Naval Personnel and Commander of Navy Recruiting were on hand to honor the 28 awardees. They received awards in several areas of recruiting, including enlisted, officer, and reserve recruiters of the year. I believe that it's important that we recognize the hard work that they're doing because they truly are making a difference. They're manning the Navy of the 21st century. When it comes to the work they do, most of the recruiters were humble. No, I don't really feel I did anything special. I feel that the men and women that uh, work for me or work under me, they're the ones that really did everything special. Many recruiters serve in their hometowns. One awardee says he became a recruiter because he wanted to give young people the chance to achieve their goals. The Navy provided me an opportunity to grow as a person in the Navy. And I, I wanted to return that to my community and uh, prove them that you don't have to be a basketball star, make millions of dollars to be a role model. 
Most of the awardees say putting qualified men and women in our Navy is reward enough. But now they'll hold their heads a little higher as they go about that task, knowing the Navy recognizes them as one of the best. Seaman Jennifer Smith, Navy Marine Corps News. 18,000 African-American sailors served the Union's Navy during the Civil War. Many of them were freed slaves. They helped the Union achieve victory, but until recently, very little was known about them or their service. Now, thanks to a partnership between the Naval Historical Center, Howard University, and the National Park Service, that's all changed. Chief Tom Cradell has the story. From the Boston Massacre to Desert Storm in Bosnia, Black Americans have and continue to serve in defense of this nation's founding principles. These patriots included 186,000 black Americans who donned the Union blue to serve on battlefields and in ships. Admiral Moore was on hand at the Navy Memorial for a ceremony to honor African American Civil War sailors. The ceremony included a traditional wreath laying. But its main purpose was to unveil a new database at www.civilwar.nps.gov. Here, you can learn about these sailors, their contributions, and their struggles. Most importantly, they serve faithfully and well, in the process helping to destroy slavery as well as to save the Union. This database is the result of several years of research by Dr. Reedy and a team from Howard University. The research was made more difficult because the Navy was relatively desegregated for its day. Black sailors served on ships with their white counterparts, so researchers couldn't just look up an all-black unit. They had to go ship by ship, sailor by sailor. One man in attendance carried the photo of one of his two great-grandfathers who served in the Civil War. He says he has an idea of what they'd say if they were here today. He'd be pretty impressed. I think he'd be, he'd be pleased for himself, probably for his mates, and for the country. The information on each sailor varies, but usually includes their ship, rate, and dates of service. Chief Tom Cridell, Navy Marine Corps News. If you haven't checked out the Navy's Lifelines website yet, well, you probably should. It was selected recently as one of the year's 10 best federal websites. The site was inaugurated by the Secretary of the Navy and senior Department of Defense officials last January. Lifelines offers self-help information, distance education, crisis assistance, professional quality of life service providers, and much more. The best part is you can access the information 24 hours a day, seven days a week, all over the world. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, Marines and Hawaii proved their combat readiness before deploying. Hello, shipmates. Mick Von Hurt here. The Navy College program is redefining advanced education methods for sailors. We've taken another monumental step forward by establishing Navy-wide partnerships with 16 different colleges. The colleges include Florida State, Old Dominion, George Washington, and the University of Maryland, just to name a few. These are established and respected colleges from which sailors can pursue their degrees. You can still use tuition assistance at any college for off-duty education. However, the colleges we've partnered with will award the maximum possible credits for Navy training and work experience. Navy College Program has sent out nearly 400,000 smart transcripts in the past year. You can order yours or get the latest on Navy College Program at www.navycollege.navy.mil. Good luck, and I'll see you about the fleet. I enlisted in the Navy when I was 17 years old. If I had not joined the Navy, life would, would definitely be very different. You're on the bridge of a warship. You get responsibility fast. I learned how to work on communications equipment and radar equipment. I had never even thought of becoming a broadcast journalist. Before I even got out of the Navy, I was hired. Three weeks after I got out of the Navy, I was hired by a network affiliate. I'm CEO and president of High Technology Solutions. If you see something in your future, go after it and grab it. I found something that uh, I was good at and that I want to do for the rest of my life. Welcome back to Navy Marine Corps News. Marines from 2nd Battalion, 3rd Marine Regiment are gearing up for deployment. But before they go, they must prove they're up to the challenge. Petty Officer Laura Castro from our Pearl Harbor Bureau has the story. 
It's called McCree, the Marine Corps Combat Readiness Evaluation, a test to make sure these highly trained Marines have all the crucial skills they need before deployment. Not only the individual skills of the Marines, but the skills of the, the team as a whole. And if you can't work as a team, then you're not going to be able to complete any of these tasks. The evaluation covers everything from live fire exercises to a full-on ground assault. And while Marines around the world participate in McCree, two, three Marines are getting a little extra help from Marine Air Ground Task Force 3. We are here supporting them. If they didn't have us, they'd be humping it or using trucks. So we're pretty much helping them, supporting them, working together. The MAGTAF acts as a conductor, coordinating all the different elements, from communications and logistics to air and ground support. Each unit helps give these motivated devil dogs a more realistic combat scenario. When you do a McCree, usually it's bits and pieces, but when you can get away, and you, like we've done here, we got everybody together, all different combat elements together, we're in one spot, and we can just concentrate and focus on what we're doing. And by helping ensure 2-3's combat readiness, each supporting element also gains valuable training. You get to see how everything's put into a play, and how everything falls in, and uh, working along with the other Marines and whatnot, you get to see uh, how teamwork this is the way things should be can't do it alone. You always need someone else. After proving they've got what it takes, these warriors know that together they can face any battle. From Puhakaloa Training Area, Hawaii, Petty Officer Laura Castro, Navy Marine Corps News. Sailors and Marines working and training together is an everyday occurrence aboard USS Juno, an amphibious transport dock ship homeported in Sasebo, Japan. Petty Officer Rob Schmelke recently got underway with the Flying Tigers of HMM-262 and files this report. Skimming over the ocean towards USS Juno's flight deck, the Marine CH-46 is ready to land. The pilot waits for the signal from the sailor on deck and then lands, only to take off and repeat the cycle. Uh, we were doing carrier qualifications. We were basically going around the pattern and uh, landing, preparing the, the air crew, uh, make sure that they're able to land on a small deck. For this to work, everyone has to work together. The crew in the helo with the personnel in flight deck control. And in the middle of all this is Airman Shane Wilson, who directs the helo while dealing with the buzzing in his headset. You got a radio on with um, the air boss right behind you telling you what to do up in the tower. Everybody's yelling in your radio telling you what to do. So you kind of just got to listen, know where the don't needs to be and put it down. Flying the pattern, landing, and then taking off again is essential practice for both the Marines and sailors who are part of the forward deployed amphibious force. Having the capability to move troops from a shipboard platform day or night in any weather is what we're practicing for and, and what we hope to get. The Flying Tigers of HMM-262 depart Juno following a port visit to Hong Kong to participate in Exercise Full Eagle aboard USS Essex. Navy journalist Rob Schmelke, Fleet Activity Sasebo, Japan. For air crew survival equipment men, terms like attention to detail and safety first are more than just catchphrases. If these concepts are not applied to every aspect of their job, lives could be endangered. Petty Officer Amy Kirk from our Norfolk Bureau gives us this profile of the PR rating. Not many of us would want a job that offered no room for mistakes and gave no second chances. But that is exactly the type of pressure the Navy's air crew survival equipment men work under daily. My job is to inspect all uh, aviation life support equipment, whether it be oxygen, uh, parachutes, life rafts, everything that a uh, air crewman or a pilot would need to fly or survival situation. Something can happen with the plane or the helicopter, we're, we're their last chance. These sailors know they hold the lives of hundreds of pilots and air crewmen in their hands and they work diligently to ensure all their survival equipment is in top form. The main challenge here is attention to detail. We have our nose in the books throughout every evolution uh, with every type of piece of gear that we use, that, that we work on. Nose is in the books because the way the book says for it to be done is the way it has to be done. Following strict quality assurance guidelines gives these sailors the confidence of knowing they did things right the first time. It definitely is a big responsibility because, you know, you're holding someone's life in your hand. 
and you have to make sure and check everything what you do is correct so you don't mess up. There are no mistakes, no second chances. Sooner or later, you end up having a, an air crewman coming back with his family saying thank you. The gear that you packed, your survival gear that you and your shipmates worked on saved my life. That's what I believe motivates us the most. With no room for error, air crew survival equipment men take great pride in their work, ensuring that when an emergency occurs, their survival gear works, and the pilots and air crewmen will return safely to their families. Petty Officer Amy Kirk, Navy Marine Corps News. Naval Education and Training Command recently announced that the Navy Learning Network will soon be going online. The NLN website will offer information technology courses such as Microsoft Word, programming and development courses such as C++, and various Navy-specific courses like damage control. The courses are free to all Department of the Navy personnel, including reservists, Marines, and Navy civilians. Keep your eye out for more information. It's time for another break. When we come back, enlisted sailors and Marines teach officer candidates how to be leaders in the fleet. Hi, I'm Hank Parker, Jr., driver of the Rick Rath and T. Marine Chevrolet Monte Carlo. Stay tuned for more Navy Marine Corps news. Definitely improving. Great job. I'm Clark Bartram, and I love to see people better themselves through physical fitness. As the host of my own daily TV fitness show, I have to stay in peak physical form. And let me tell you, it's a tough workout. Staying fit and healthy is just as important for sailors and Marines like you. It keeps you physically tight and mentally sharp. And when you feel good, you perform better. And that's one of the reasons Navy life is getting better every day. Welcome back. Officer Candidate School lays the foundation for some of the Navy's future leaders. Petty Officer Nika Melendez shows us how senior enlisted sailors and Marines use their experiences to teach officer candidates. Throughout the 13 weeks of OCS, enlisted leadership has an incredible influence on the officer candidates. Marching, basic seamanship, and damage control. When you're using a banding patch, we do store this in the repair locker. Are just a few of the things these enlisted men and women teach to help shape the future leaders of the Navy. The senior enlisted leadership in the Navy is uh, the backbone of the Navy. They, they run the Navy, leaving the management to the officers, and uh, we respect that, and they have a lot to teach. At 310, you should have ordered, shift your rudder. We get to learn as officers from someone who's been out in the fleet that has been there uh, turning the wrenches. The most easily recognized figure at OCS is the Marine Corps drill instructor. The Marine Corps uh, drill instructors, they have such a strong sense of honor and commitment to their corps, and um, I think the Navy really wanted to instill that in their officers. These committed Marines mold these candidates into naval officers. They fill many roles. Sometimes dad, mom, big brother, all in one. A drill instructor would probably be, in general, a father, except a very, very intense father. And they say the rewards of all this hard work are endless. Best part of being a drill instructor is seeing the finished product, getting, getting candidates in in the beginning and see what they start out like and watch them cross parade deck as ensigns. Their dedication shows. The drill instructor is probably one of the most impressive persons in this entire school. I want you to sit up straight. Keep your hands away from your face, feet flat on the deck, but I do want you to relax and I want you to ask questions. Is that understood? Yes, sir! Drill instructor, yes, sir! he's actually an amazing man. Uh, when we first get here, you learn to hate the guy. And he's, he's very intense and you don't know what to expect, but it's amazing the transformation you go through in a short amount of time and it's all his influence. These weeks of training go beyond the parade deck, the grinders, and classrooms. Every once in a while, the candidates get to experience life at sea. What we do is we instruct them in the classroom in theories of seamanship and navigation, and then actually bring them out on the vessel to uh, reinforce those theories of what they learned in the classroom and actually allow them to put those theories into practical application. 
Steering to course 050. Hands on training like this isn't limited to the yard patrol boats. Candidates also learn basic damage control in real life situations. They are going to be the future leaders of the Navy, and as a leader, if they have never seen this stuff, then it's kind of hard to lead people in an emergency type situation to get them to do what they need to do. These candidates also recognize the importance of this training. It's important because many of the officer candidates here are going to be reporting to ships for the first time. It's very important that all individuals on the ship know how to do this type of uh, uh, damage control. You're going to salute the ensign. The officer of the deck will return that salute. The chiefs are here to instruct. The added benefit is the officer candidates experience the relationship between the wardroom and the chief's mess. We try and instill in the candidates from the beginning that the chiefs are the ones that are going to make them successful out in the fleet. Reporting from Pensacola, Florida, Petty Officer Nico Melendez, Navy Marine Corps News. Earlier this year, we showed you the Rick Rathbun's Team Marines racing car, which debuted late last year. And now Rathbun's team has competed for a full season in NASCAR's Bush Grand National Division. Team Marines returned to the Homestead Miami Speedway for this year's final race, just one day after the Marine Corps birthday. The number 53 car sported a different paint scheme celebrating the occasion. But whether it's red, white, and blue, or just red or black, the number 53 car attracts a lot of attention from Marines nationwide. Well, it seems like it is because 98% of them that come and talk to me and say, hey, that's our car. You've got to do good in our car. So they don't refer to it as my car anymore. It's, it's the Marines car, and, and I just happen to be the driver. Joking aside, Hank Parker Jr. knows he's also part of the Marine team. It seems like they've really accepted me with open arms. But it's this man and his desire to give back to the Marine Corps who's made Team Marines possible. There's a lot of former Marines and a lot of present Marines that are really behind this program and appreciate what we're doing. And it really all boils down to honor, courage, commitment, and integrity. And that's real, the real deal. And there's just so many of us out there that all feel the same way about this. The Marine Corps does not sponsor Rick Rathbun's Team Marines Racing because that's against the government's general ethics code. But the Marine Corps can buy advertising space on the car and team uniforms. And recruiting officials say the idea has paid off. The message coming in from my recruiting station commanders out in the field is this is a fabulous program and we want to continue to do it. And we hope to do so in the 2001 season. Music has been a part of many sailors' lives for a long time, even from before they joined the Navy, and it continues to provide a source of entertainment and relaxation. In our next story, Petty Officer Miranda Williams of our San Diego Bureau introduces us to some sailors who keep the music going aboard their ships. At work on board USS John C. Stennis, this sailor is dedicated to doing a good job. But after working hours, he's ready to forget about the day's worries and cut loose. For me, anyway, it helped the deployment go by so fast that it was like nothing. It was fun. It made it, it made it that much fun. And he's not alone. Many sailors across the Navy, including me sailors on board USS Abraham Lincoln, are strumming away their free time in off-duty bands. And there's nothing more satisfying to the soul than picking up your guitar and you know, putting down a couple of licks and just relieving the stress that you, know, you might go through during the day. Keeping a band going is challenging, but these sailors say it's worth it in the end. It's hard. We all stand different watches, different times. You know, there's days that we'll only get to practice an hour and maybe not practice at all. Judging from the support they get, their love of music is contagious. The MWR is actually helping us out, trying to set us up with different gigs. Um, when we pull into port, it really helps our morale a lot. And it helps the morale of, you know, the other people on the ship that we'll play for. Just the fact that I've been able to fulfill one of my fantasies to play on stage in a, in a club, but this outlet here has allowed me to, to fulfill that fantasy. <laughs> And it's through the, through the Navy that I was able to do that. Whether it's a dream or just a hobby, these passionate sailors are dedicated to making their bands work. From USS John C. Stennis and USS Abraham Lincoln, Petty Officer Miranda Williams, Navy Marine Corps News. The Navy launched a website last year that provides a direct connect to technical support for sailors worldwide. This week, Cyber Sailor takes us to that site. When you're at sea, the last thing anyone wants is for a piece of equipment to go down. The good news is that the search for technical support just got easier thanks to anchordesk.navy.mil. 
The Anchor Desk website is a distance support site that connects you to the people who can answer your questions on equipment problems. The links range from weapons and propulsion systems to basic supply needs. The home page gives you several options. You can submit a question online, talk to someone immediately using the integrated call center, or you can access the portal to search for the information yourself. The portal is broken up into seven different areas. For example, you can click on Ordnance to contact the Naval Ammunition Logistics Center. Here, you'll find phone numbers and the address for Ordnance support. The Anchor Desk sitemap is another way to access these links. This sitemap shows you all of the websites available through Anchor Desk and gives you the internet address for each one. Anchor Desk isn't limited to just technical support. Any sailor can use this site to access additional links. Click on More Links to view the Additional Support Links page. Some of the sites available are the Bupers, Navy Housing, and Defense Finance and Accounting Service web pages. If you click on the link, Anchor Desk will give you a brief description of the site. Then click on the red title to actually go to that site's homepage. The greatest feature of AnchorDesk.Navy.mil is that whatever question you may have, the people at Anchor Desk will get you the contact information you need. So add this site to your list of favorites. If you have any questions or if there are any other sites you'd like me to share with the fleet, send them to cybersailor at mediasend.navy.mil. I'm Airman Chris Reynolds, Navy and Marine Corps News. Well, that's the show for this week. As always, we'd like to hear your thoughts and ideas about Navy and Marine Corps News. So call our feedback line or send us an email. The number and address are coming up in a minute. But before we go, we'd like to say BZ to Navy Captains David Harlan and Stephen Hoffman of the Naval Medical Research Center in Silver Spring, Maryland. Navy Secretary Richard Danzig recently recognized the captains for their work in biomedical research. Captain Harlan was recognized for developing a new therapy to help the immune system to accept transplanted organs. Captain Hoffman was recognized for his work in developing a malaria vaccine. We'd also like to say hello and thanks for watching to our viewers in Long Beach, Mississippi, for watching us every week on Coast TV Cable. We leave you this week with another look at Officer Candidate School. Until next week. Take care. At the same time, Admiral Yamamoto is opposed to going to war with the United States because he does know what the United States is. Our runners left full, passing 2-4-0. Event of a casualty, the general alarm will sound. I'm left steering to course zero five zero. Salute the ensign. The officer of the deck will return that salute. I want you to sit up straight, keep your hands away from your face, feet by the deck, but I do want you to relax and I want you to ask questions. Is that understood? Yes, sir! When you're ballistic, you're going to get people's attention. I am ready to relieve you. Yes, sir! For 51 years, Marines have donned their dress blues and headed off to wage a special battle, one that puts smiles on the faces of children. 
The annual Toys for Tots campaign is now underway across the country. The goal? Collect and hand out toys for children who might not otherwise get presents for the holidays. Marines in our nation's capital kicked off their local drive with special ceremonies, then got down to the task at hand, giving presents to children. Well, over the last month, uh, there's been a lot of hours involved. Uh, it started to get worked out and run down and everything, but when we come here to the Children's Hospital and to see the child's face light up, it makes it worthwhile. Um, I'll work 23, 24 hours a day just so I can see that again. It's like a fun toy. It looks like it. And the Marines say they plan to distribute 7 million toys nationwide for 3.5 million children. The men and women of the USS Grapple play an important role in the Navy. And they're often the difference between a beach ship being salvaged or a total loss. In a recent training evolution, the crew of the Grapple intentionally beached an old Coast Guard ship so they could test their salvaging skills. About five feet off our roller now, sir. We've gained uh, the experience of extracting a, uh, a ship off of a beach, which is a very, very difficult uh, evolution. Uh, I think, but most of all, we gained the uh, confidence, uh, the crews gained the confidence in their ability to, to do evolutions like that. Training is an important part of the USS Grapple's mission, but the only way to practice salvage a beach ship is to actually do it. This can be a dangerous job, so safety is always the number one concern, even in training missions. We have safety briefs before every evolution. Every time we take a break, they, we come back and they brief us again. Everybody has hard hats on, safety equipment. Teamwork is the key to a safe and successful mission. You can't do this by yourself. We can get the ship there, but if we can't lay the legs of beach gear that we laid, uh, which takes you know, almost the entire crew to do, uh, we, could, we couldn't do it. Teamwork is, the, is, is critical. While no ship in the Navy wants to call on the USS Grapple services, the crew is trained and ready, just in case. Aboard the USS Grapple, Petty Officer April Gormflo, Navy Marine Corps News. One hundred sailors stationed in Jacksonville, Florida, re-enlisted recently at the home of the NFL Jacksonville Jaguars. I think it's an honor and a privilege to serve with um, the uh, United States Navy, and I'm re-enlisting today, um, hoping to uh, complete my 20-year uh, service in the military. This is something I've been doing for a long time, and I, I'm glad to have the opportunity to do it again. Uh, being a military man, uh, this is something that's true and dear to me. Up the coast from Jacksonville, nearly 400 Marines from the 2nd Marine Division at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, raised their hands and pledged to stay Marine. Many of them decided to re-enlist because they're proud to be Marines. It's not every day a person gets to join a service. Uh, nonetheless, the Marine Corps, you know, to travel the world and see different things. Master Sergeant James Miller is a career counselor and has helped re-enlist more than 200 Marines. We have got out and talked to all of our first-term Marines. We have showed them all what the incentives that they have, which we do have numerous incentives this year. Following the ceremony, Marines celebrated by running with the division's commanding general. These service members are continuing their careers in the military, not only because of the many job opportunities and educational benefits, but because they feel a greater sense of pride in serving their country. Petty Officer Evangeline Minor, Navy Marine Corps News. Secretary of the Navy Richard Danzig recently signed an agreement with leaders of 16 colleges and universities that makes it easier for sailors to earn their college degrees. Now, colleges like Florida State University and Old Dominion automatically accept rating-specific credits to be applied toward a degree in a job-related field. Officials say it benefits both the sailors and the Navy. Sailors who are better educated tend to stay in the Navy. 
we also know that better educated sailors are better sailors. So it helps the Navy in our readiness, it helps us in our retention, and it will also help us in our recruitment. The Commander of Naval Education and Training has been working on this for the past two years. The program started with the creation of smart transcripts for every sailor in the Navy, whether they just started boot camp or were getting ready to retire. It records automatically all of the uh, courses the sailors have taken. Uh, it uh, records uh, their advancement. And every time a sailor completes a course where there's been recommended credit and when they're advanced, it uh, will automatically add in uh, their college credits. That means what I learned in e-school counts as journalism credits that I can apply directly to an associate's or bachelor's degree at one of two schools. And what sailors learn in the classes they take to finish their degrees can be applied on the job. I use it every day in my work. We've developed and implemented programs here that I've learned the techniques to develop the programs through my coursework off duty. Although not all ratings are included, the Navy College program has plans to expand it, offering them in the future. This is the beginning of a, of a new program that hopefully will provide educational opportunity for sailors around the world. For more information about the Navy College Program and what colleges accept credits from certain ratings, check out your local Navy College office or log on to www.navycollege.navy.mil. Seaman Jennifer Smith, Navy Marine Corps News. Good shot. Good job, Horeski. It's called the bull in the ring. Get back. One down, Dawson. Get back. It teaches you to stay on your toes and react in a split second. And it's one of the last challenges Marine security guards have to face before they're allowed to graduate and move on to the real world. And once stationed in the fleet, Marine security guards could deal with this pressure on any given day. It's pretty intense, and, and your adrenaline's kind of pumping, so um, basically you have to try to remember everything that they've te taught you from the basics and try to try to apply it out here. I could use a little work, but I think the, my first time out, I did pretty well. The second time, I mean, I got knocked. I got knocked pretty well. The pressure MSG Marines feel in the ring is necessary. It helps them deal with real-life situations. Some of the you want to be aware of out here, uh, yeah. just doing the techniques properly. Uh, so just in case you get into a real situation, uh, you're doing it the right way. As close to the real thing as it, as it gets. The PR-24 is the nightstick that security guards train with. It can be dangerous, but they're taught... ...to hit people at, so it's not to hurt them, but to, to, to get them off of you or to stun them, but not to kill or life-threatening type situation. I just saw to get a visa, please! Some of the things we're looking at is to... Um, make sure that the Marine is not using excessive force within the force continuum. These instructors teach the security guards to determine how much force is necessary and what to do when a person or group of people become violent. You got this room behind me. Somebody come in the room behind me. You made it. Once you entered the room, you, you uh, cleared the room quickly. You didn't, you know, you didn't hesitate. The Marines are separated into fire teams to sweep and clear a large trailer filled with a hostile force. We need some more firepower going in there. Marines inside the trailer are going to be using this type of simunition. It's a paintball round that can be loaded right into their 9 millimeters. I think simunition is the best thing that ever happened in the Marine Corps, period. Uh, just the simple fact that you, you're use, utilizing the actual weapon itself. Uh, so that's, that's as realistic as you're going to get without sending rounds back and forth. Using their 9 millimeters, they enter the trailer, scanning and moving, quickly learning it's not like it seems in the movies. I'm hitting my leg and my shoulder. A lot of the devil dogs, as they're coming out here, they'll jump out into the open and start firing. Fire, fire. Hey, from the chair, from the chair. Where in actual reality, a bad guy firing back would hit them pretty quickly. So I want them to get the, the idea they've got to stay behind cover. Marines learn these skills and endure tough training because the better prepared they are before they hit the fleet, the easier it is to keep lives safe. Engage, engage, watch, someone come down this hallway right here. Sergeant Scott Pesca, Navy Marine Corps News. Standing duty on USS Fox.
boxer isn't what it used to be. 12 section duty is great because it's almost two weeks between each duty day and that gives you time to take leave without interfering with your duty day. Yes, that's right, 12 section duty. And while that may sound unbelievable, look at what the ship's galley does when USS Boxer is underway carrying Marines. Having a 24 hour speed line help brings up the morale. Um, you get a lot of varieties in the food. To stay open 24 hours a day, the galley works in three ships, and their customers say it's a convenience they really appreciate. 24-hour food line is a major benefit because if you're working or working out and you can't get away during your lunch period, you can eat whenever and whenever you happen to be hungry. When they aren't eating or standing duty, these sailors and Marines are enjoying some of the other quality of life advantages on USS Boxer, like the ship's store, library, or laundry room. I prefer to do my own laundry. I don't like someone else doing my laundry for me, so the fact that we do have a fairly large laundromat is very helpful. A self-service laundry, 12 section duty, and 24 hour a day chow line are innovative quality of life improvements that these sailors say have made working and living on board USS Boxer easier. A lot of it has to do with, like I said, people taking care of people. You as senior people, sometimes we, we get so involved with some of the big items, but it's the junior kids to see some of the real issues that are going out there. I actually enjoy being a part of this crew. I, I don't want to leave it. really shows that the boxers higher ups care about their people. From the USS Boxer, Petty Officer Miranda Williams, Navy Morning Corps News. Um, it's an interesting job. It's uh, not something that everybody can do. You know, you got to go through a lot of school and you got to be dedicated to know your equipment. Seaman Apprentice Holden is one of 13 sailors who maintain nine radars that help the ship fulfill its mission. Each radar has a specific function, such as instrument landing systems or target acquisition. And it's this kind of technology that intrigues these ETs. Personally, I just love electronics. It's really interesting. Uh, never gets old, there's always changing, technology is always changing every day, and uh, particularly in the, in the military, and it's just something I like, love being a part of. These techs keep their radar working by doing preventative maintenance daily. This can take a few minutes or up to several hours to do, but thanks to these protective measures, they can keep these important radars up and running. Without radar, you don't know what's out in front of you um, beyond what you can see, which in certain conditions isn't very far. Though they may be out of sight, Contacts over the horizon can be kept in plain view, thanks to the Bonhomme Shards electronics technicians. From San Diego, Petty Officer Chris Robinson, Navy Marine Corps News. Program of Flow College Education, or PACE, has helped thousands of sailors work toward their bachelor's degrees while underway. Now, Old Dominion University in Norfolk is expanding on the PACE program to help those same sailors turn their bachelor's degrees into master's degrees. The opportunity to start a master's program out at sea is unique and new. Um, sailors, especially for the price of what it will cost, is very advantageous. The feedback from the students has been very positive, particularly as regards the quality of instruction, the quality of the professors that have been uh, providing them a link to the United States during their deployments. Old Dominion uses Navy satellites in connection with the Navy Learning Network to deliver lectures to the deployed ships. Sailors aboard USS George Washington, USS Abraham Lincoln, and USS Tarawa were the first sailors to receive the classes and have nothing but praise for the program. It's outstanding. This I look forward to every Sunday night. It was very challenging. USS Harry S. Truman and USS Nassau installed all the equipment needed for the MBA classes just in time for their Mediterranean deployment. During the six months underway, professors will broadcast simultaneously to both ships, no matter where they're operating. They also make sure the students can get into a regular weekly class schedule, and that means sometimes professors have to teach at 2 in the morning. It isn't the most convenient class to teach, but the professors say their students are worth it. And I think back here in the United States, as we're all dry and comfortable, we should never forget those people that are at sea working in very challenging conditions. And if we can provide them an opportunity to further their education while they're out there, I think they deserve 
Absolutely everything that we can give them. Petty Officer Catherine Anderson, Navy Marine Corps News.